not appealing to be approached by an old lady for any reason, I think, you know? Uh, <laughs> I feel like a dinosaur. Absolutely. And I'm a vegetarian dinosaur, so, you know, I'm from the Pleistocene era. Hi, welcome back. Robert Adams described a work as a record of compassion and Gregory Halpern called her the greatest portrait photographer to have ever worked in the medium. She and her work aren't flashy, and that's probably why she has a low profile. It's also because she chooses subjects that are outwardly unremarkable. But if you prepare to really look, you start getting extraordinary insights into the individuals as well as into humanity as a whole. She manages to present her subjects with a straightforward simplicity, but captures the complexity that makes each human unique. As a self-confessed social loser, she's intimately familiar with the awkward and painful realities of life. She manages to connect deeply with her subjects during the short periods that she photographs them. And she walks away with portraits that speak volumes about both them as well as about her. The more one delves into the depths of these portraits, the more questions that one asks. They say that the camera never lies, but it can stretch the... Judith Joy Ross grew up in Hazleton, a small coal mining city in Pennsylvania, where her father had a five and dime store and her mother taught piano. She took a photography course at the Institute of Design in Chicago, and her tutor was the famous abstract photographer Aaron Siskind. Although she was socially awkward, right from the start she was drawn to portraiture. She had to conquer her own self-consciousness in order to create connections with people. She described the process as real torture. She sees the making of a photograph as a tactile and sensual experience, even though she admits to not coming to terms with her sexuality. When you look at this portrait of a young schoolgirl, you can almost feel her wish to escape from the limelight and to quietly shrink into the background. Ross said that this young girl is a perfect reflection of her. She seeks out the beauty that lies in ordinary experiences of every day, but she doesn't want to transform that ordinariness. She felt adrift her whole life, and through this feeling of separateness, she learned to observe with clarity and humanity. She says that she's interested in people, but she doesn't want to get too close to them. She keeps them at arm's length by retreating behind her camera. It's interesting how she's worked with her limitations in order to maximize her ability to capture the individual in each sitter. It's almost as if she's bottled up all of her potential to connect with others and then pulls that emotion and intimacy into the moment of photographing. So the point is, whatever you react to in life, it can become 60,000 times more intensified because you make it an image. The making of the image just amplifies what you see because of the frame. I don't ask anyone to pose. I ask them to hold still. Just hold still. And usually with enthusiasm, I said, oh my God, don't move. Duh. That's it. I mean, I don't have conversations with people. I have enthusiasms. For an early series titled Yorana Park, she revisited a public swimming area close to her family's old summer cabin in Weatherly, Pennsylvania. Russ was treading water because she was mourning the recent death of her father. She wanted to return to a place that reminded her of her childhood joy and to find an answer to the question, why is life worth living? The portraits that she made of young children are not so much answers to this question, but more reminiscences of her own youth, before what she describes as the heaviness of adulthood. It's because my father had passed away 
and I loved him dearly and missed him a great deal. And I couldn't stand looking at adults because there's pain in so many people's faces. I knew to come here to photograph this place where there were children, most, almost always unaccompanied by adults, uh, at just being kids. She said that she was trying to hold back time to preserve adolescence, the time when ice cream and sandcastles are more appealing than cars and sex. There's an innocence about these young people. They're not attempting to hide behind a cool disguise. This body of work became her first comprehensive essay in what would become her recognizable style. She had worked out how to shift her bulky camera so that she could shoot in portrait format rather than in landscape. And this was the first picture that she really felt good about. Those are my first substantial pictures, uh, a series about a place where you could be safe, where life was good, as good as, it, you know, not perfect, but good. I struggled for many years to make, to finally make pictures like this. And it, it held the answer, why is life worth living? It's still about being ordinary and how wonderful it is to be ordinary, visually anyway. Ross uses an 8x10 inch plate camera mounted on a heavy tripod. She said that the camera made such an impact. It was like the circus coming to town. Most of the people that she photographed felt special and chosen. The process of setting up a view camera takes time and she was hidden behind the black cloth. So the subjects were able to gather themselves before being photographed. She blurs the background so that the shadows and shapes become indistinct. All of the irrelevant details fall away and we are left with a quiet and refined communication. And the great thing about it is the camera is so seductive because it's wood and it's beautiful. It's like if you had a wooden vacuum cleaner, you'd probably vacuum more, right? Because it would be like a beautiful thing, right? It's seductive to have a big wooden camera and you put a cloth over your head so you look like an idiot and so people forget there's this thing going on in front of them, this weird person with a cloth over their head. Anyway, it's, it's a way of communicating that's different. I would never, I don't like pointing a camera at somebody at all. When Ross prints her work, she makes contact prints, almost never enlarging bigger than the 8 by 10 dimensions of the negative. She believes that large prints could be exploitative. She sees the smaller prints as more intimate, inviting the viewer to come closer. She also varies the chemistry that she uses, which accentuates the individuality of each of the sitters. Depending on the subject, she uses gold chloride to bring out either the greys or the brown tones. That picture had to be in grey because adolescence and awareness of sexuality. So I printed her gray. That's gray too. That is a wonderful, peaceful place. The, the tone means something, but there's not one meaning. Russ is deeply affected by the horrors of war. And in 1983, she was listening to the radio when she heard that the Vietnam Veterans Memorial in Washington, DC, was being unveiled. She immediately thought she should go and photograph. She drove the 200 miles and booked into a cheap hotel, surviving mainly on sardines, which was all that she could afford. She felt uncomfortable lugging this huge camera around at what she thought was a sacred space. Most people turned her down, but some people allowed her to photograph them. Looking at these photographs now 40 years on, they haven't lost their power. One is haunted by the depths of emotion that she's managed to capture. Although these portraits are directly related to this Vietnam Memorial, 
They are more of a universal acknowledgement of loss and the suffering caused by war. When John Sikowski saw these portraits, he chose 16 of them to include in a show called New Photography at the Museum of Modern Art. The actual memorial structures don't appear in these photographs. I mean, I'm sorry, you have to read the title. It says Portraits at the Vietnam Veterans Memorial. If you don't read that, you're not going to understand something about these pictures. This is the only person that's actually looking at the memorial. And then the memorial doesn't fit in, it's not in the pictures. It's in the faces of the people in whatever way that it might be. August Sander's work had a strong influence on Ross. She studied the photographs closely and would often pore over his books before going off on a shoot. Her work is recognizably distinct but they both display an intense commitment to emphasizing the individual nature of each of their subjects. Every picture is the result of a meaningful encounter between the photographer and the sitter. I thought that this was quite interesting. She says that the authenticity within a portrait comes from a photographer's recognition and not from the subject's behavior. Ross has followed a very narrow line from this point on, she pursued various projects, but all of her portraits have a similar feel. That's not to say that, as a viewer, one gets bored by the repetition. Instead, it's like learning a language that initially only the photographer could speak, and suddenly you start to enter her world. With each essay, she broadens the language. Until for me, it doesn't really matter so much what the essay is about. I just want to see how Ross has interacted photographically with this particular person. Throughout her career, she found a way of experiencing humanity through photography. Her images don't jump off the page and nothing about them says, look at me. But if you do look closely, you discover that she has an intangible ability to reveal the deeper essence of each person that stands in front of her camera. She makes us look closely at each individual and we find ourselves asking questions about their lives. Thanks very much for staying with me and I'll see you next time. Cheers. They're not my pictures. They're pictures that really worked that I had a hand in making. They're not my pictures. That was a miracle to get kids with little feet that look like ducks and and uh, that was a miracle to get those little things in the corner. That was like an homage to Arge. And to get the guy looking over like a Romeo at the, that was all a fucking miracle. Yeah. Uh, there's no, I never even, well, what do you do to make that happen again? I don't know. I haven't even considered it.